In order to understand the choices that people make and the actions that they take to pursue those choices among foraging peoples, that is hunting and gathering peoples, you have to understand the world in which they make these decisions. Geology, in the sense of studying the more recent geologic past, it's called quaternary geology. It's the last two million years of time. That time period is something that's extremely relevant to archaeology. It's the world in which peoples of the past live. And it's not like what we see right here. Today along the river, what we see is that the floodplain, or the part right next to the river that gets uh, covered as the river comes up in the spring, doesn't really have a lot of trees or brush. It's mostly uh, grasses and bare rocky environments. The plants are very different, the climate's very different, but it depends on what we're talking about time-wise. So what I want to do here is show you the different layers and talk about them generally so you can understand how the different layers relate to environment changing through time and how we begin to think about what people might have been able to do at different points in time. So you see that some of the layers have different colors in them and the color differences can be because of a lot of different reasons. It can be uh, due to the fact that there's more organic material in them. Sometimes it's due to the fact that the mineralogy is changing a little bit through time. Other times it's because there are different things added to it. So starting from the very top, up here for the top where my hand is, is a part of the site that relates to road construction that occurred in the Salmon River Canyon in the 1930s. And the WPA was producing uh, a large road cut through here that was going to be part of US Highway 95. They didn't decide to ultimately finish this, but this part of the canyon was actually uh, subjected to their construction. In that layer, we might find pieces of chain or rusted pieces of metal, or even pre-contact artifacts, projectile points, debitage, and there's flakes. We find bone, fragments, shell, and so on. The next layer down is more of a gray, uh, sandy deposit, and this layer is due to the river, the Salmon River, flooding and producing a sandy beach at this part of the site. The archaeological content of this is relatively low. As we get down a little bit deeper, it transitions to a brown sediment. This brown deposit is more river sediment, but it's farther away from the channel. In fact, if we were to go farther to the river this way at this point in time, we would probably also run into this sandy part right next to the river. And this represents lower energy flooding. Fine sediments can just simply come out very gently out of suspension, out of the river sediment. Uh, and basically it's a floodplain on the edge of the Salmon River. Within this deposit, we find the majority of the artifacts here at the site. Well over 50% of all our items will come out of this layer and this is a very intensively occupied layer. From this point down, we get a, another kind of gray deposit that's a little harder to see. And this is also a riverine sediment, and it's slightly different than this one. Its mineralogy is different, as a different iron and zinc content, for example, that allows us to separate these two apart, plus their appearance is very different, and it allows us to excavate them separately. Below this layer, we get into two packages of windblown dust or loess, as it's known. During the last ice age, glaciers were in the headwaters of the Salmon River Basin, grinding up bedrock and producing a flower-like rock substance that would wash down in the rivers, go into the floodplains, the wind would blow it up onto the canyon walls, and it can accumulate in thick packages like this. Conditions it takes to produce this in the Salmon River Canyon are basically cold, dry environments. And as I mentioned before, since they're derived from glaciers, that's exactly the kind of environment we would expect could be around the canyon at this time. We probably had less vegetation or at least different kinds of vegetation uh, than we have today in the canyon. This deposit, this brown uh, floodplain sediment, probably has more of a rich, lush, riparian vegetation. This deposit probably has more of a vegetation cover that has more trees, more brush, a little bit different than what we see today. As you go to different time periods in the past, the world changes. In the case of peoples here, there are things that maybe they would want to pursue, but the distribution of resources was set by environmental attributes. Climate, the way the river was operating, even fire regimes, you know, things that could control vegetation cover. Archaeology is the study of humans and their material culture and also how they interact with the environment. 
Archaeology is looking at the human past through the study of the material remains they leave behind. Archaeology is the study of the ways of life of people of the past. We try to find tools they made, bones they left behind, some kind of evidence to help us tell the story of how these people lived. Archaeology is the study of human culture and specifically we understand human culture and behavior through the material items that they leave behind in the ground. So from those items we can start to understand past behaviors and adaptations and what people have been doing in the landscape through time. Archaeology is about everything in a sense because if you want to understand what people are doing in the past, their world, you can approach this from the angle of geochemistry, biochemistry, from isotope chemistry, from you can approach it from biology, paleontology, everything has a voice in the archaeological past. So it gets difficult, you know, to know where the boundaries are. So one person cannot be an expert on all these things, of course. So we tend to work in teams. My name is Dante Knapp. I'm a prehistoric archaeologist working on my master's, um, trying to look at what was the paleo environment like during the different periods of occupation at Cooper's Ferry. And so in order to reconstruct the paleo environment, we're using micro plant fossils. And it can allow us to identify the types of plant species that were growing on the surface during these different periods of time and help us reconstruct the broader environment and the different opportunities and constraints it would have provided the first peoples coming into the canyon. I'm Jessica Ainsley. I am one of the graduate students of Dr. Lauren Davis. I'm here at the Cooper's Ferry site to help students learn about procedures and excavation. My research is on the Oregon coast, looking at sediments and soils and how early cultures have interacted with the environment. My name is Justin Holcomb. I'm a graduate student at Oregon State University, working with the Pacific Slope Archaeological Research Team. Uh, my particular focus is geoarchaeology. And what geoarchaeology is, is it combines the traditional methodologies of geology with current analytical techniques. And that allows us to study site formation processes um, what I mean by that is it allows us to study how archaeological sites are formed, how they change or, de or are destroyed, and how they're preserved. This in turn allows us to better predict where early sites could be within the landscape. Hi, my name is Alex Nyers. Uh, I work here at the Cooper's Ferry Archaeological Site. I have a background in information technology. I've done a lot of work with uh, computers and networks and that kind of stuff. Uh, my primary role here uh, at Cooper's Ferry is doing things like operations, that kind of stuff, setting up all the computer stuff as well as just the day-to-day -day operations of operating a field camp in an environment like this. And everyone worked together to get all the samples that they needed to conduct their own research aspects of our team-based exercise into figuring out what uh, actually happened here at the Cooper's Ferry site what it means in terms of people solving problems in ecological space such as the Lower Sam River Canyon. Also, trying to figure out how long people have been here. Now, what we do next is we go back to the university and we work on a lot of the material that we've recovered from this summer. We're gonna be doing a lot of different kinds of lab analyses and uh, using certain kinds of techniques that are not the kinds that we would do in the field, but we're gonna learn a lot about the materials that we've collected from the site this summer.